Uh, welcome to the 19th ECS uh, Cloud Feedback Symposium. Um, so uh, today we have uh, Yue Dong, Matt Longo, and Yi Huang who are going to give presentations. So just before we get started, a uh, brief reminder, we're going to have three AGU style talks with questions after each talk, and then a short uh, Q&A, general Q&A after the last talk, if you have time to stick around. Uh, if you have questions or comments, type them into the chat at any time, or you can also raise your hand and uh, we'll unmute you and ask you to, and you can ask the question live. If uh, you'd like to give a talk or you have ideas for, um, or you want to nominate someone to give a talk or have ideas for um, things we could do in, these, uh, in this series, um, please contact someone on our executive committee. So Shia Lee, Andy Dessler, Christy Preciosescu, uh, me or Jonah. And um, Andy maintains this website where you can see videos of all past talks. You can sign up for our mailing list. Um, there's our contact info and, and more um, at this address. Um, with that, we'll get started with Yue Dong, who's um, uh, a NOAA, um, I forget exactly what it's like, climate change and global change uh, postdoc fellow at Columbia. Um, so you wait to go away. Yeah, that's it. Can you all see my screen? Is it full screen now? Yep, looks great. Uh, yeah, thanks for introducing me. Uh, I'm Yue from Columbia University. Uh, yeah, so this project is a kind of a follow-up project of my PhD thesis uh, that I defended in uh, at the end of last year at the University of Washington, uh, where we looked at the impacts of Antarctic ice sheets meltwater on uh, climate sensitivity and transient warming. Uh, special thanks to the committee for scheduling my talk uh, in this month, because last month, in the last symposium, I think we had a good talk uh, on a similar topic from Gavin Schmidt, uh, so we're now I assume oh, we're all relatively familiar with possible implications for ECS from a freshwater additions. Uh, although in Gavin's talk, he's mostly looking at some GIS model simulations. Well, uh, in this work, I've been mostly looking at uh, CES1 simulations. And I'm gonna talk about some uh, quantitative results of the changes in climate sensitivity and transient warming. And I'm gonna, gonna argue that uh, half of the change in transient warming is due in response to uh, Antarctic meltwater is due to a feedback changes that is through the pattern effect. So let's start. So I, I, I like to start with this SSD trend pattern. Let me move my zoom bar here. Uh, this SSD trend pattern since the 19, uh, 1979 in observations on top and in model, uh, multi model mean on the bottom. Then you can see models in general produce biases uh, most pronounced in this Eastern Pacific and the Southeast Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean. Uh, where observations show this cooling trends, but models in general miss that. And these are results from our new paper led by Rob Wills, uh, where he systematically quantified a model observation discrepancies in SSC trend patterns and sea level pressure trend patterns. Uh, if you're interested, please check it out. It just got accepted last week. Um, yeah, so regarding this model observation discrepancies, uh, a lot of proposed mechanisms so far, for example, due to natural variability, like it looks like a negative phase of an IPO or a PDO within the Pacific sector, or some studies argue that it could be due to model biases in either rated forcing or the force response. Uh, for example, it could be due to tropical Pacific, a uh, bias the tropical Pacific SD response to CO2 forcing uh, or bias response to aerosol forcing. Uh, however, in this work, I'm going to specifically focus on the possibility that the lack of Antarctic meltwater in models could potentially explain part of the model observation discrepancies. And by Antarctic meltwater, uh, particularly here, I'm referring to the freshwater input from the melt of Antarctic ice sheet and ice shelves. Uh, the, the meltwater simulations or the so-called hosing uh, experiments, this approach is not new at all. It has been widely applied in uh, for example, polar climate community. Uh, for example, so this is a result from a GIS model. When you have additional meltwater input from the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, it increases up ocean stratification and you end up having the surface cooling response, subsurface warming and surface freshening uh, all in the, local, uh, in the local response. So most of the attention so far 
has been given to the local response in the Southern Ocean or Antarctic uh, in response to meltwater inputs. And these results are appear to be uh, pretty qualitatively consistent across models. Uh, at global scale, uh, uh, some studies found that uh, including meltwater input can reduce the near uh, projected near future warming. And for this reduced global warming, uh, it has been proposed to largely arise from more efficient uh, Southern Ocean heat uptake, given all of these changes in the Southern Ocean, especially the vertical distribution of the heat. But we wanted to ask, is that a full story? Uh, the reduced warming rate in response to meltwater is it only causing by a uh, caused by the uh, heat uptake changes? Because when you come back to this very simple zero layer uh, global energy budget framework, we have external forcing like F uh, on transient transient time scales. Of course, you have heat uptake uh, governed by heat uptake efficiency kappa term, but at the same time, the heat can be also relatively dense at the top of the atmosphere, so it goes up and uh, determined by the parameter called rated feedback lambda. Uh, so in principle, the global warming rates should be determined by both heat uptake efficiency, so the efficiency with which heat go into the deep ocean, and lambda, so feedback, with the, the efficiency which, with, with which heat is uh, going up or going to space at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, but so far, when we think about reduce the global warming rates by the meltwater, people have assumed that it's only uh, caused by kappa change. So we wanted to ask how much of the meltwater induced change in global warming rates can be explained by kappa change, this heat uptake term alone. In other words, how much is left to be explained by feedback changes, which have not been uh, quantified. And if, if we see Antarctic meltwater does change feedback a lot, then we ask, is it mostly through local process or remote response? Uh, so we looked at, uh, looked at two published CS1 simulations, uh, one by my, <clears throat> by my colleagues at the University of Washington, Andrew Colling, the Cecilia Bits. Uh, they performed this uh, hosing rounds over his, mostly over historical period. And another one is by my, provided by my co-author, uh, Shaina Sadai from University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she looks into the 21st century, but both using CS1 and for both ensembles, all of the simulations include a realistic time variant historical and RCP 8.5 radio forces. Uh, for the meltwater, meltwater rounds, we add additional meltwater. Uh, for the future ensemble, uh, uh, Shana uh, as meltwater input uh, based on an offline ice sheet model estimate uh, forced by the same RCP 8.5. And it includes not only uh, freshwater discharge, but also the effect of latent heat. But for historical ensemble, uh, Andrew imposed uh, more like an idealized and a constant rate of freshwater input of 2,000 gigaton per year. Uh, if you ever wanted, uh, wondered how much uh, freshwater flux that we observed over this historical period, uh, first is remains observation remains very uncertain. Uh, but still, I have to be honest that it's it's much smaller, like four to five times smaller than we actually post the model. Uh, but in a second, I'll show you some results showing that even though we're sort of overestimating the amount of freshwater input to the model, or our simulations still show underestimated surface freshening trend. So it's very likely that our simulations still or not overestimating the response to the observed surface freshening. Uh, so let's begin with some uh, local response, local response in the Southern Ocean. So here I'm showing the uh, zonal mean, uh, Southern Ocean potential temperatures in color and the salinity trends in contours. So uh, over historical period in the bottom, I, on the top and over 21st century in the bottom from these two ensembles. The left is control round with already forcing. The middle is meltwater rounds with additional meltwater. And the red column is different, simply reflecting the effect due to uh, meltwater inputs. And you can just focus on the red column, you can see meltwater can cause anomalous, uh, anomalous surface uh, cooling in the Southern Ocean and uh, uh, subsurface warming in the Southern Ocean, along with this dashed contours, which indicates surface freshening. All consistent with, uh, largely consistent with previous studies. And then if you compare with, uh, compared to observations, observe the trends over the same historical period, and you can see, uh, Adding, a num adding fresh water can qualitatively bring the model closer to observation by producing anomalous cooling trend in the Southern Ocean and surface freshening. Although, uh, although th th these response are still much weaker than observation, especially like the salinity trends, they're still like underestimated 
uh, surface freshening. So these are local response in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and next, we're, uh, we're looking at global response, global SST trend pattern uh, over historical period on the bottom, uh, on the top, and 21st century SD trends on the bottom. Again, control round with already forcing, melt one around in the middle, and the difference. Uh, focusing on the difference, you can see, well, in addition to this Southern Ocean local surface cooling, cooling can also extend to the uh, deep tropics, most pronounced in the eastern side of the Pacific, forming this La Nina-like cooling pattern. Uh, again, if you compare with observations, uh, the uh, addition of uh, um, freshwater input can bring the model qualitatively closer to observation by producing this net cooling trends in the uh, southeast Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean and the Eastern Pacific, uh, but still uh, weaker than observations. Uh, but I should mention that the cooling trend over these two regions are exactly the two regions where observations show greatest cooling trends over, over recent decades. And regarding this tidal connection from Southern Ocean to the tropics, uh, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, good studies are, uh, investigating the pathways uh, for this tidal connection. For example, from uh, uh, the long uh, idealized simulations where we impose lunar media flux, we found some early studies have found that this teleconnection from southern ocean to the tropics can be established through changes in zonal mean heat, uh, atmospheric heat transport uh, associated with ITCD shifts. Uh, but I also want to mention that some recent studies, uh, including my own work, uh, identify that the teleconnection between southern ocean to the tropics is strongest between the southeast Pacific sector of the southern ocean and to the Eastern Pacific. And specifically those two regions because the mean wind of the vaccine here, the climatological mean wind near the mountains here uh, is particularly if, uh, efficient, can, uh, can efficiently um, affect surface temperature anomalies into the deep tropics. So once the tropical SSDs uh, perturb, it can further strengthen the teleconnection uh, through either a subtropical circulation change through raspberry waves or by enhancing subtropical cloud feedbacks. So these are some recent studies also arguing the atmospheric pathways. Uh, of course, oceans could also play a role, uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, subtropical cells. So over here, I'm not going to the details of physical pathways of uh, this teleconnection. Just wanted to list some uh, proposed mechanism, which all show that uh, there could be a teleconnection from high latitude, southern ocean, to the low latitude, uh, which, is what, which is happening here in our simulations. So uh, having shown the local and remote response, uh, last time come back to this global mean warming rate. Uh, you can see by adding anomalous fresh water, this global mean temperature uh, time series, uh, the addition of a melt water can reduce the global warming rate by 20% in the historical ensemble or by 28% in the future uh, 21st century projections. And since we said that based on this zero layer energy budget, uh, global warming rate should be in principle governed by these two terms. So let's uh, feedbacks and ocean heat uptake efficiency. Let's quantify changes in these two terms respectively. So first for the kappa term, the uh, heat uptake efficiency parameter, we found it increases. It becomes stronger uh, from heat control around to the melt water rounds in both ensembles. Uh, this is probably not surprising given all these changes in the southern ocean vertical temperature vertical distribution that I showed earlier. You can see surface cooling and sub subsurface warming to so indicate anomalous uh, heat accumulation at depth without causing surface temperature to change. So this redistribution exactly indicates more heat, up, uh, more efficient heat uptake in the Southern Ocean. Uh, so not surprising that this kappa term increases uh, in both ensembles. Uh, but at the same time, it was found that this lambda term, the radio feedback, also increases, uh, or I should say, the negative feedbacks. Uh, strengthen, it becomes more negative, uh, the magnitude increases. And then that corresponds to a lower effective climate sensitivity either over historical period or over the 21st century. Uh, and we argue that this change in the feedbacks is mostly due to the pattern effect uh, because the, uh, the addition of a fresh water can cause this anomalous surface cooling in the Southern Ocean and in the Eastern Pacific, those re two regions where low clouds can effectively reflect short radiation back to space. And indeed, we find the local cooling uh, through changing lower tropospheric stability can indeed uh, increase the uh, low cloud cover in these two regions, uh, which you may expect a more negative cloud feedback or low cloud feedback. 
uh, yeah, so 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 uh, so for now we find both kappa term and lambda term change and change in a way that they can reduce the global warming rate. Uh, so the last question we ask is that uh, what are the relative roles of the changes in heat uptake efficiency and uh, feedbacks? Which term plays the biggest biggest role? So to quantify that, we come back to this equation, this approximation. Uh, so simply, we just substitute values of the reinforcing lambda and kappa that we calculate separately to this equation and find that this equation or approximation can pretty accurately reproduce the actual warming rate from model simulations like like this is construction this is cs uh, actual simulations so now we're confident that this is a good approximation for us to separate the impact of the lambda and the kappa so next we ask how much uh, uh the warming rate would have been if only lambda change or only kappa change. In other words, in this equation, we only change lambda or kappa at the time while keeping the other unchanged. Then we can get an estimate of a warming rate due to lambda change alone or due to kappa change alone. And finally, if you, uh, we compare with the control room, control estimate, and you can see, for example, in this historical case, we see total of uh, a 0 0.02 Kelvin per decade difference, the reduced warming. And that's half of that is explained by feedback changes and half of that is explained by kappa changes. In other words, the kappa and uh, lambda both uh, uh, each account for approximately 50% uh, of the total change in warming rate. And this result also hold in the future ensemble. So, uh, so here we found in both ensembles, uh, melt water reduces global warming rate via changes in both heat uptake efficiency and rate of feedback. And the latter has not been uh, widely appreciated. But here we found that the impact of a, uh, feedback changes can be as substantial as impact of the changes in ocean heat uptake efficiency. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so let me summarize this results. Uh, we looked at two public CES1 amount water simulations, one over historical period, one over 21st century. And we found in both ensembles, at least in this model, CES1, uh, Antarctic meltwater can cause local and remote changes. Uh, both bring the model closer to observations. Uh, the, indi the, the implication of this result is that uh, although we can still, we cannot exclude the possibility that recent observations are caused by natural variability, but this result indicates that maybe part of the observations or the observed trend pattern may be partially a, a forced response, forced by Antarctic meltwater. And in the presence of a continued amount of water in the 21st century, this pattern may also uh, persist in the coming decades or centuries. Um, and we also quantify the impact of a uh, heat uptake efficiency and radio feedbacks on the global warming rate. And we found they both are important. The changes in heat uptake is caused by local uh, change in the upper ocean stratification. Uh, and radio feedback depends on uh, both local and remote SSTs. So, tell, so important. Uh, the, the teleconnection to the tropics is important. Uh, so the implication is that we, uh, if we need to accurately uh, project future climate, uh, then we need to accurately represent melt water and its impact on both local and remote SSD trends. Uh, yeah, I think I'm good on time. Yeah, that's the end of my slide. Thanks. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yue. That was a great talk. It was really fascinating. Do we have any um, questions in the Q&A or uh, does anyone want to raise their hand? Um, maybe while we wait for a question. I just uh, I just had a quick one. Um, first of all, the uh, can you talk a little bit more about exactly how the addition of the meltwater increases the ocean heat uptake? Uh, is, is it, is it, is it is a, a change in the overturning in that in the Southern Ocean or? Um, yeah. Yeah, this relates to the uh, southern sort of mean states over this high latitude. Is climatologically it should be uh, upward heat transport from the relatively warmer subsurface uh, subsurface to relatively colder surface in climatology. Um, but by adding normal fresh water, it increases upper ocean stratification, so it reduces this upward heat transport, upward heat fluxes from the relatively warmer subsurface to the surface. Ah, okay. So it causes uh, anomalous heat accumulation at that. Okay, um, thank you, thank you, Wei. Uh, uh, we have a question from Karsten. I'm, I'm gonna uh, let's see, ask him to unmute. Oh, it's in the, it's in the here. Let me. Uh... Did that work? Yes, that worked. Yeah. Here. 
You can just uh, also really quick one. So does that mean that the equilibrium state, say in 2300 or something, would return to like a expected warming state or like what would be your guess the the end result in in a radiative equilibrium would look like yeah in the true equilibrium when this melt water effect is uh, like a, the saturated i i think well if we consider like long enough equilibrium and then probably this melt water effect is only acting on transient it wouldn't change that much of the on the true long-term equilibrium so maybe uh, so so i'm arguing this impacts on transient warming or effective climate sensitivity. But I expect um, really long equilibrium, this melt water effect will be saturated or eventually the Southern Ocean will warm up. Okay, so thanks. My... Oh, thanks, Carson. That's a great question. Um, do we have any more questions before we proceed? Um, maybe we should, uh, let's thank Gwei again and uh, maybe let's move on to our next speaker. Yeah, I think there's some, um... Questions in the chat, UA, so please keep an eye on that. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Longo from Scripps. Matt's a grad student, and uh, he's going to be talking about something I think kind of related to UA's talk. OK. Uh, you guys can see the full screen, right? Yep. Yes. Great. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Longo. Uh, like Nick said, I'm a grad student at Scripps. And thanks to you uh, for uh, introducing the discussion of teleconnection uh, pathways, uh, because today I'll be presenting work that I've titled The Surface Pathway by Which Northern Hemisphere Extratropical Cooling Elicits a Tropical Response. And this is work that I've done with my advisors at Scripps, Shangping Shi and Ian Eisenman, and our collaborators at National Taiwan University. Uh, so prior studies have shown that northern hemisphere extratropical top of atmosphere cooling leads to a tropical response. So what I'm showing on the left here is the idealized aerosol-like forcing from the extratropical tropical interaction model intercomparison project, uh, which we've called ETINMIP. Um, and what I'm showing here is the northern hemisphere extratropical cooling case. So basically what happens is that top of atmosphere solar insulation is reduced from 45 to 65 north, and that uh, reduction is minimized at 55 north and falls off as a Gaussian. And again, this is supposed to sort of mimic aerosol-like cooling. Uh, and even though this forcing has been applied pretty far in the northern hemisphere high latitudes, we see that there's actually a remote response in the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Uh, I'll draw your attention specifically to the relative SST patterns on the right here. We see a La Nina-like pattern uh, in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific and a negative Indian Ocean Dipole-like pattern in the Indian Ocean. And we know that these tropical patterns are important for global uh, atmospheric circulation and the pattern effect, what have you. So some studies have pointed to subtropical cell changes as the drivers of equilibrium tropical patterns. Um, so subtropical cells, we're really talking about a subsurface ocean pathway by which temperatures change. Uh, on the left here is just a schematic showing the thermodynamic understanding. So you can think of that really as mean advection of anomalous temperature gradients. So there's cooler temperature and the mean subtropical cell. And other folks have suggested maybe it's a dynamic response. So it's anomalous advection uh, of mean temperature gradients. And we can just go ahead and let that subtropical subsurface, uh, subtropical cell subsurface debate rage on because these discussions ignore an important atmosphere and surface ocean pathway, which can communicate and sustain extratropical variability in the tropics. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So my main research questions here are through which climate feedback processes does Northern Hemisphere extratropical cooling reach the tropical Pacific? And then why do these processes lead to a La Nina-like and a negative IOD-like steady state response? And that last question is in opposition to El Nino or a positive IOD-like response. So to answer these questions, we model the forced ocean atmosphere response as a function of surface buoyancy forcing and surface wind stress forcing. And by that, in the schematic, I'm trying to show the changes in top of atmosphere insulation are communicated through the atmosphere, and then they affect the ocean by a surface buoyancy forcing and surface wind stress forcing. So by buoyancy here, I'm really talking about density. So the fact that heat fluxes, whether through turbulent heat fluxes or radiation can affect the temperature. Uh, and then the fact that wind stress really imparts momentum into the surface ocean. 
And we run three ensemble members of five distinct cases in CESM 1.2, uh, which are designed to systematically isolate buoyancy and momentum forcing. Uh, in a prior study, I introduced a wind stress overriding protocol, which allows us to determine the ocean's response to surface buoyancy forcing alone and surface momentum forcing alone. Uh, the really quick explanation of that is that I'm piping in either the unforced control wind stress or the forced uh, wind stress from etimate forcing. And together that gives us three responses that we care about. There's the fully coupled case, FC, buoyancy forced BF, and momentum forced MF. You're going to see FC, BF, and MF in this presentation, so just keep those in mind. And we assume a largely linear framework, so the fully coupled response is largely encapsulated by buoyancy forcing and momentum forcing. And that residual is quite small, which we show in the prior paper. So on to the results. Uh, the first result is that buoyancy forcing dominates the fully coupled subtropical uh, response. If you're looking at these two plots and you're saying, wow, these look really similar, then you've gotten the gist of what the slide is supposed to show. It's really supposed to show that the fully coupled case on the left looks a lot like the buoyancy forced response. Um, I'll draw your eyes to a couple things in particular. We see a strong SST zonal dipole, so it's much cooler near California than it is near Japan. Uh, and we also see a large scale anomalous anticyclonic near surface wind response. And together, those really constitute the forced response. It's a little bit stronger in the buoyancy forced response, but very similar in the fully coupled case. And the pattern of these responses really tells us that some of the forced modes. Um, in particular, we believe that the positive low cloud SST feedback drives the SST response in the Northeastern subtropical Pacific. So on the left here in the color fill is the reduction in shortwave surface radiation. And coincident with that, as the contours is the strong increase in low clouds. So basically there's been a strong increase in low clouds and that reduces shortwave radiation at the surface. And then on the right here, I don't have time to get too much into the details, but we've introduced an ocean mixed layer SST decomposition. And the long story short of it is that the SST change, the total response can be approximated as a result of ocean dynamics, radiation, which includes short wave and long wave, but is primarily short wave and evaporative cooling, which is primarily wind speed effects. Um, and what I want to point your attention to here is that the total response of SST in this region is large. The total response, that's the black bar, is largely a result of the red bar, which is buoyancy force. And that total response is largely a result of radiation. Uh, and that's mostly short wave in the buoyancy force case. So what we have here is that a strong increase in low cloud concentration reduces surface short wave radiation and locally cools SST. And those locally cooled SSTs, uh, those anomalies can be communicated to the tropics via evaporative cooling. Again, I'm showing the buoyancy force case uh, that I showed earlier. And you can see that this large scale anticyclonic wind is really kind of pushing the winds in a, a clockwise path. Put, the winds are pushing the SST in a clockwise pattern. And that's the wind evaporation SST feedback, which is the primary driver of the Pacific meridional mode. And that can carry cool extra tropical anomalies southwestward or warm anomalies northeastward. And again, in the ocean mixed layer decomposition, we see that the total SST response in the subtropical southwestern Pacific is largely driven by evaporative cooling, which, like I said earlier, is primarily wind speed. So these two buoyancy force positive feedbacks act as a coupled system in the subtropical Pacific. And the basic behavior of this coupled system can be captured by slab ocean model simulations because we're not focusing much on ocean dynamics. But you might be asking, well, we were talking about La Nina at the beginning, what about the tropics? And you can pretty clearly see that without momentum feedbacks, the Bjerknes feedback can't occur. Specifically, you see that on the left in the fully coupled case, that La Nina pattern, which I was pointing out earlier, is basically totally absent from the buoyancy force case on the right. So we can zoom in more on the tropics in particular. So in this top row here, that's from 10 south to 10 north, and that's the SST response. We see that the fully coupled La Nina and negative IOD-like patterns are primarily a result of the momentum force case. So you can see there's this clear zonal dipole in the Pacific Ocean and a clear zonal dipole in the Indian Ocean. And we see that the buoyancy force case, like I said, kind of provides sort of a background cooling. When you look at the subsurface, you also see these zonal dipoles in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Um, and 
Similarly to the surface response, those are largely a result of momentum forcing. And these are pretty indicative of the so-called ENSO tilt mode that we hear about in the literature. Uh, in the mixed layer, buoyancy forcing, like I said, just provides sort of a background cooling. There is something interesting happening in the subsurface in the Pacific that we'd like to look into next, but uh, we haven't looked into too much thus far. Uh, so we find that changes in ocean circulation figure more prominently in the Eastern Equatorial SS, Pacific's SST response. Uh, so here I'm showing that relative to the tropical mean, the fully coupled case is primarily explained by momentum forcing. So here in the total SST response, it's largely driven by momentum forcing the blue bar, which is not what we saw earlier. And this is relative to, to the tropics. So the 20 south to 20 north uh, mean is subtracted out. And I don't show it here, but most of the cooling results from changes uh, from zonal changes uh, that are momentum forced. So that's either a change in zonal currents or zonal temperature gradients. Uh, and this is in opposition to what some folks might think of, like maybe upwelling has changed. And then this circulation is driven, the circulation driven cooling is primarily opposed by decreased convection and equatorial cloud cover. So basically this SSD cooling leads to less convection, less cloud cover, more short waves hitting. So that's a negative feedback. So now the question is, why does momentum forcing lead to the negative phase of ENSO and IOD in particular? Uh, well, the way that you need to think about this is that the way that our wind stress locking works is we take the wind stress from the fully coupled case and we pipe it into the momentum force case so that the momentum forced ocean feels the fully coupled wind stress. But I spent the first half of this talk telling you how similar fully coupled and buoyancy force cases were in the subtropics. And so what we believe is that the buoyancy force PMM provides a subtropical wind stress boundary condition for the tropical response. By that, I mean you can see anomalous easterly wind stress in the Western Equatorial Pacific in both buoyancy and fully coupled, and anomalous westerly wind stress in the Indian Ocean. And it has a pretty strong pattern correlation. And uh, when you have these two specific uh, easterly wind stress in the Western Equatorial Pacific, westerly wind stress in the Indian Ocean, you're going to get a La Nina and a negative IOD via Birkness feedback in equatorial wave dynamics. So considered together, we propose a pathway of three coupled feedbacks. In the subtropics, which is primarily buoyancy force, we have the low cloud SST feedback creating local SST anomalies. Those SST anomalies are then carried to the tropics via the west feedback in a Pacific meridional mode-like pattern. And then once in the tropics, these anomalous easterlies from the PMM kick off the Bjerknes feedback, which is momentum forced, causing a tilting of the thermocline. There's also a large scale uh, isothermal or isopycnal heave of the thermocline from the background cooling of buoyancy force, which is why I show the upward arrows here. And uh, this pathway seems to be somewhat robust across GCMs. So here I've plotted the seven etin mip member model responses. Uh, on the left here is some dynamically linked quantities. So that's shortwave CRE in the Northeast Pacific low cloud deck versus Walker cell strength and Nino 3.4 SST anomaly versus Walker cell strength. And it's quite a strong correlation. Uh, but more importantly, we see that the, the beginning and the end of our feedback pathway, so the low cloud uh, shortwave CRE and the Nino 3.4 SST anomaly are also pretty strong. Uh, so that tells us that GCMs with a stronger subtropical low cloud response exhibit a stronger La Nina response. Uh, so that brings us to our conclusions which are that a pathway of three coupled surface ocean atmosphere feedbacks communicates extratropical cooling to the tropics and then sustains that cooling. Buoyancy force adjustments dominate in the subtropics and momentum force adjustments create equatorial and zonal asymmetries. And then this feedback is potentially robust across GCMs. So uh, thank you. This work is in review at GRL and my email and Twitter are below and I'll take any questions, thanks. Thank you, Matt. That was a fascinating talk. Um, please, if there's any questions for Matt, uh, put them in the chat or, or raise your hand. Maybe I'll, I'll start out with one. Um, do you have any thoughts about the implications that, that a mechanism like this would have, say, for historical uh, estimates of sensitivity or the, you know, the way that aerosol forcing affects, affects ECS in general? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Jonah. Um... So I guess I'll just go to the first slide here, which basically is that this idealized aerosol-like cooling, obviously it's not 
uh, our best guess at how aerosols have forced the climate over the historical period. But if this is if these aerosol dynamics hold up in some capacity, uh, and that creates some sort of La Nina like pattern and negative IOD like pattern in the tropical Pacific, that's obviously going to affect uh, the observed climates that we've seen. So it would be an interesting thing to look more closely at uh, observations, and it's something I was just talking to Ian about yesterday. Excellent, excellent. Um, any other questions out there for, for Matt? Maybe people can uh, think about it. If you have any more, feel free to add to the chat, uh, or uh, or maybe we can, we'll have a little bit of discussion at the end. But let's let's thank Matt again. That was really fascinating. Um, and we'll go to our last speaker. Good. So our last speaker is Yi Huang of McGill University. And I think we're going to change gears a little bit and um, talk about radiation now. Um, do you see my slides in the right mode? Uh, this looks like presenter mode to me. What about now? Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, good. Thank you for confirming. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've tuned in to many uh, ECS symposium talks. So I wish to thank you all, Andy, uh, Nick, Jonah, Lisha, uh, Christy. Thanks for organizing this series of interesting talks. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, uh, different topic uh, that's the stratospheric water vapor feedback. And this is based on the works of my group members, including Yu Wei, Yan, Han, and Ruo Guo. Um, okay, stratosphere may be uh, relatively remote to many of you. So let me give you some introduction slides first. Uh, first, uh, the stratospheric moistening uh, is shown by some data sets, but there is a big disagreement between the uh, data sets. So whether there is a moistening chance or how strong the moistening chance, uh, the answers to these questions very much depend on which instrumentation group you talk to. And the answer may even differ from one version of the data to another. Um, but in the GCMs, uh, almost all the GCMs, they show a quite uh, robust uh, and uh, uh, in some cases very strong uh, stratospheric moistening during global warming. Like shown here, this is the projection of the stratospheric water vapor change uh, given in the log two Q uh, measures. So value two here means four times moistening compared to the present state in this co-dropping CO2 experiment. So you can see across the models, there's generally a very strong stratospheric moistening. Uh, this was a paper based on uh, AR5 models for the AR6 models, uh, very similar pictures. And uh, very interestingly, uh, like reported by this paper by Xia et al, um, we find that the moistening seems to be accelerating uh, at warmer temperatures, the moistening rate is seemingly also increase. Uh, like in this CAM ESM5 model, a Canadian model, you can see that at warmer temperatures, uh, the warming rate is stronger than uh, the colder temperatures. So all this interesting uh, and the strong moistening in the stratosphere according to the question, uh, whether this matter, whether this matter specifically for the climate sensitivity. Uh, quite a few people have argued that this is important. Um, the assessments uh, mostly based on this fixed dynamic heating method, which I'll come back later. Um, they put on numbers for quantifying this stratospheric water vapor feedback to be between 0.2 to 0.3 watts per square meter per K. So what does this number mean? I think in one of Andy's papers, this is very well explained. A 0.1 watts per square meter per K feedback uh, is about, is equivalent to 0.4 K of warming. 
uh, for an ECS of four degree. So 0.3 watts per square meter per K as argued by some papers, that would mean more than one K of the warming can be attributed to just the stratospheric water vapor. So apparently this could be a significant contributor. Uh, and then how can we verify this? Um, this is an experiment we try to do and to verify the impact, the warming impact of the stratospheric water vapor. This is a mechanism denier experiment. So we did it with the CESM. So first of all, we run a typical uh, quadrupling CO2 experiment. And the results is shown like this blue line here. You notice very significant warming in this CAM uh, plus uh, slab ocean model simulation. Uh, after several decades, uh, the model equilibrates and the warming is, uh, the warming amounts to 7.7 K for global mean temperature change. If you do the uh, inversion based on this radiation energy budget equation, this is 1.1 watts per square meter per K total feedback parameters change. If as expected, so the stratospheric water vapor contribute, has contributed to 0.3 watts per square meter per K to this total, then you could uh, subtract this contribution out. And then based on that inference, without the stratospheric water vapor feedback and warming, you would expect it to be about 6.1 K. However, when we do a locking experiment in this model, uh, we fix the stratospheric water vapor concentration to the control runs, okay? And this is a locking um, in a similar design to the cloud locking, maybe some of you are more familiar with. But when we do this, when we, by design, suppress the stratospheric water vapor, the warming suppression in the simulation is much less than what we had expected. So in the end, uh, there was still 7.5 degree warming. Uh, so first, this seems to confirm that stratus water vapor plays a positive feedback role, but the magnitude seems to be much weaker than what was expected. But then why? Okay, we try to trying to reconcile some of difference here. Uh, let's maybe uh, look at how the previous assessments um, obtained that expectation. So to measure the warming effects of uh, a radiative force uh, like stratospheric water vapor, uh, the conventional view is that uh, the stratospheric adjusted radiative forcing would be a good indicator of the warming effect. Uh, if you're radiative transfer person, you know there are this, all these different kinds of uh, radiative forcing definition. From the radiative, from the instantaneous radiative forcing, which is just due to the radiative force change, to the stratospheric adjusted forcing, which is to include the stratospheric temperature change associated with the perturbation. This can be usually done by using this fixed dynamic heating method. So you assume the dynamic heating isn't changing and thus the radiative perturbation would lead to radiative heating rate change. You use that change of radiative heating rate to drive the temperature relaxation, or not relaxation, but adjustment. Then you can simulate a radiatively radi driven stratospheric temperature change. And then, in addition to the status adjustment in theory, that could be also troposphere adjustment as explained by this classic paper of Hansen. And then the full climate response would be the response to the fully adjusted forcing. So the conventional view is that the stratospheric adjusted forcing is usually a good measure of the warming or cooling effect of radiative force. Uh, for example, for the CO2 uh, forcing agent, this is the case, uh, like reviewed by this paper for different models. Um, we could uh, see that for the quadrupling CO2 forcing, instantaneous forcing of it uh, amounts to the bulk of it. Okay, 
5.3 out of 7.2 is due to instantaneous forcing. A stratosphere adjustment significantly add to it because as the CO2 reduces uh, the stratospheric temperature, the cooling reduces outgoing long wave radiation. If you measure the forcing at a TOA, this is a additional forcing, it's about a four watts. But for the tropospheric adjustments, uh, in, in terms of multi model mean, uh, this is a very small number. So then is this also true for stratospheric water vapor? Okay, we, as well as many preceding works have assessed both instantaneous forcing and uh, the stratospheric adjustment to the instantaneous forcing. Like uh, in this paper by Banerjee et al, uh, they took the stratospheric moistening pattern as simulated by different GCMs and they used this as the perturbation to drive a port model simulation, which is essentially are ready for adjustment simulation. Uh, and first uh, they measure on uh, the instantaneous forcing here. So this number is, is the radiative effect of stratospheric water vapor alone. That is the change of the greenhouse effect of water vapor when you just increase the stratospheric water vapor. Oh, the assessment for the instantaneous forcing here in conclusion is a very small number. We don't have disagreement about this. And then adding the stratospheric adjustment as you increase the humidity in the stratosphere, it's uh, uh, increased the radiation, thermal radiation from stratosphere to the space. This is a cooling mechanism. So you are get the cooling temperature pattern in the stratosphere. And again, because of the Planck effect, this reduces outgoing radiation and for the TOA radio forcing this add to on the uh, stratospheric water vapor total radiative effect. And so if we do this quantification, you'll find that this indirect radiative effect of stratospheric water vapor is actually quite, quite a big number, much bigger than instantaneous forcing about one order magnitude bigger. So in other words, for the stratospheric adjusted radiative effect of uh, stratospheric water vapor, uh, the bulk of the effect is coming from adjustment, not from the instantaneous forcing. But so far the adjustment has gone through the stratosphere. Then what about the troposphere? So the locking experiments offered an answer uh, to this question. Uh, you can see that uh, this is quite a busy slide. So let me, walk you through them. We have three columns of results here. First is a standard experiment. That's the standard quadrupling CO2 experiment. So you could see that uh, in this simulation, we have significant warming. And so we have, uh, uh, together with surface warming, we have atmospheric tropospheric warming. We have tropospheric uh, moistening and also the stratospheric moistening. We have cloud change and the surface albedo change due to sea ice melt. These are all very significant changes. And so in the locking experiment, that's the second column here. That's where we fix the stratospheric water vapor concentration to its control values. And then we do this uh, projection driven by the co-jopling of CO2. You could see, for example, here, as we have fixed the stratospheric moisture and there's no stratospheric water vapor change. And then the difference between these two experiments, we can attribute those change, those adjustments in all these variables to be due to the stratospheric water vapor effect. First, you have the moistening itself in the stratosphere, and then you have the stratospheric temperature cooling, which we just uh, looked at in those fixed dynamic heating experiments. So these are all confirming the uh, previous understanding. But together with this stratospheric temperature change, you also notice there is troposphic warming effect by the stratospheric water vapor. And you also see some noticeable cloud effect in the troposphere. When you add these effects, when you add their radiative effects for the TOA budget, then you will realize, I'm not showing the numbers, uh, the paper does have them, but uh, qualitatively speaking, this troposphere change are modifying the stratospheric cooling induced uh, warming effect of the stratospheric water vapor. So in other words, this 
consequent tropospheric adjustment is offsetting the FDH method assess the warming effect of stratospheric water vapor. And the offset is to such an extent that most of it's gone. And thus the stratospheric water vapor warming effect, uh, there's very little of it in the end. OK, um, this is my talk. I have a very simple uh, message. Uh, accounting for the tropospheric adjustment significantly modified the assessment of the stratospheric water vapor warming effect. And in this locking experiment, we find after accounting for the full adjustment, the locking are uh, the relative effect and thus the warming is reduced to a very small number, much smaller than 0.1 watts per square meter per K. And that's it. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Yeah, it's a very stimulating talk. Um, we we uh, we do have um, some questions in the chat. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll read this first one from uh, from Gabriel Chiodo. Um, Thanks for the nice talk. I'm wondering uh, whether you can reconcile these results uh, with another paper, Leah Newman, 2020, which used a similar technique, nudging, but with another model and showed a, a, a much bigger effect on ECS, about 10%. Um, is the disagreement due to the details of the technique, state dependencies, or model dependency? That's an excellent uh, question, Gabriel. Thanks for it. Uh, I, actually have a, I should have a slide uh, speaking to this. Let me see where I can find it. Uh... It's quite a coincidence that uh, when we published our paper, we find a paper of very similar topic uh, coming out yeah. about the same time. And that's this uh, mm -hmm. Lee and the Newman paper that Gabriel is asking about. Uh, I'm still searching. Okay, there it is. Okay, do you see the slide now? Yes. Okay, so this is a based on a guest model. Uh, different from ours, their model is a fully coupled model, but there are some uh, notes we should make about this simulation, this experiment. First, you could see either from the temperature response and from the remaining radiation imbalance, this model didn't run into uh, equilibrium. And so besides that, so it's known that this model has some energy imbalance issue. So, uh, the number they get, again, by a locking idea, although different technique, 0.1 watts per square meter, this is still lower than the uh, numbers pre previously argued, but larger than our numbers. Ours is like 0 0.03, so like three-fourths difference. So you can see that so from these points, if you if you take into consideration possible uh, change of the feedback parameter values uh, as approaching to the end periods of the equilibration process. I don't know, but by eyeballing this, uh, this may be bringing these two experiments to closer uh, magnitudes of the feedback parameter. So that's one, one note I want to make. And another note I want to make is through um, communication and through the looking at their modeling data. Uh, so fully kindly provide this data for our analysis. One thing, an important thing I think we confirm is that those tropospheric adjustment that I mentioned, specifically including the tropospheric warming and uh, the high cloud response to the stratospheric water vapor response, this change that happened in the CESM also happened in similar way in their model. So this compensation mechanism is also uh, manifesting themselves in this experiment. Although in the end, to the time they have simu run their simulation too, this compensation had, didn't lead to the same amount, same extent of compensation. I hope that answer uh, Gabriel's question. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, and yet one, one more question here from, from is, um, are the tropospheric adjustments sensitive to the details of the nudging technique? 
e.g. how do you transition from the stratosphere, fixed water vapor, to the troposphere, uh, free running, changing water vapor? Okay, I didn't get a second part. How the how how do you transition from the stratosphere fixed water vapor to the troposphere free running? Okay, um, there are different. The first of all, um, this whether the results are sensitive to the setting of the locking. <laughs> Apparently, between these two experiments we just talked about, there is some sensitivity. Um, but so whether the mechanism whether sen is sensitive to this, I think from our uh, co-analysis to date, I think those compensating mechanisms, we verified they exist in both cases. And then how you monitor the transition from the stratosphere to, to the to the troposphere. But technically there are different ways you can do it. Uh, you could, uh, for example, run a single column model that would allow you to simulate the full adjustment, including both relative process and non-relative process like convective process driven adjustment. So there are technical ways to do this. In this locking experiments, uh, this adjustment is more diagnosed out when looking at the uh, full model simulated uh, change. And then we, by comparing with and without uh, stratosphere water vapor change, we can see the difference. And that difference, since the only uh, prescription difference is stratospheric water vapor. We can attribute those difference to the stratospheric water vapor. That's we think this is a nice mechanism deny experiment. And so this I think is the most worth understanding. Okay, thank you. I, I think that makes sense. Um, we're coming up towards the hour. So if, if there are any questions that people have for uh, all of our speakers or, or any speaker, please feel free to share them. But in the meantime, I'm just going to keep sharing some of these questions that we have for for Yi. Um, we had a question from from Andy, uh, which is, do you think the Honga Tonga eruption will have any climate effect to the injection of H2O into the stratosphere? That's uh, that's a great hypothesis, Andy. Uh, I think I'm interested to know the answer. I, I, I hope that interests you, CO2. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, t the Tonga Hunga eruption is kind of uh, special in because uh, it was underwater. So together with the aerosols, it's also bringing uh, water vapor into the stratosphere, a lot of them. And uh, different instruments are already noting uh, the signatures in those uh, species in the stratosphere. And then the next question is how much radiative effect, how much uh, climate effect uh, this may be causing. And I think uh, the nature is answering that question by itself already. We need to continue observing and, uh, and then we modeling if we, if we can see a response in the nature, we can use modeling to try to understand it. This is a kind of perfect, uh, uh, not intentionally, but the controlled experiment we can use for understanding the stratospheric effect on, on the surface climate. Good question, Andy. Thank you. And we have a we have one more question here from uh, Robert Pinkus. Very nice work. It seems like stratospheric water vapor changes would be tied to surface temperature. So aren't these a feedback rather than a forcing? Ah, that's good. A philosophical question. Um, our conventional way of separating the feedback from forcing is whether. Uh, at the beginning, how quick it happens. And now I think a more physical uh, distinction is whether it's uh, associated with or whether it's conditional or the surface warming. So in that sense, at least in the models, I think most of the models simulate uh, uh, climate uh, change in the stratosphere, the moisture in the stratosphere because of the surface temperature change. Uh, if you fix the surface temperature, for example, in a fixed SST experiment, you don't observe as significant stratosphere moistening. But in the nature, whether this thing is a forcing or feedback response to the warming, uh, I think both possibility exist. Uh, like the volcano case we just uh, mentioned, uh, that would be a forcing that because it's external to the surface temperature change. Um, yeah, I think the answer is they can, it can be both. Thank you. 
Well, uh, we're, we're at the hour. Um, let's thank our speakers again. I think this is a, a great series of talks and, and uh, we'll see you at the next ECS Symposium. Thank you all. Bye. Hey, thanks everyone. Bye, bye everybody, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, bye.